Good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today is, today's talk is entitled, Measuring How Well Subjects Know and Do in Neuropsychiatric Clinical Trials. My name is Andrew Jordan, and I'll be your host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes, and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive, so please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and if you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using the chat panel. And at this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode, and the presentation slides will advance automatically for you. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. And at this point, I would like to thank Premier Research, who has helped develop the content for this presentation. Premier Research is a leading mid-sized CRO serving highly innovative biotech, pharmaceutical, and medical device corporations. The company has a wealth of experience, having managed over 320 neurological projects in the past five years alone. The company employs more than 1,000 people and operates in 50 countries. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today's event. Matthew Healy is currently a senior manager in the clinical management department at Premier Research. Mr. Healy is responsible for all aspects of functional management, supervision, to the clinical management staff, including but not limited to, limited to performance management, guidance on corporate policy, training, and support. Mr. Healy has over 18 years of clinical research experience, including site coordination and management, clinical monitoring, clinical team management, and clinical operations management. His experience includes six years of coordinating and project management experience at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Department of Psychiatry. He has extensive training in neuropsychological concepts from the Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic for the administration and interpretation of numerous neuropsychological assessment instruments. Within the CRO environment, he has over 10 years experience working in the capacity of a clinical research, research associate, clinical team manager, and clinical operations manager. And our second speaker for today's event is Thomas Lag. MD, MPH Director, Product Development Consulting and Regulatory Medical Writing Support for Premier Research. Dr. Thomas Laga is an experienced psychiatrist who helps design effective clinical trials and develop sound protocols for Premier Research customers. Specifically, he has participated in writing several protocols in ADHD, analgesia, fragile X syndrome, and multiple sclerosis over the course of his career. He completed residencies in internal medicine and psychiatry and earned board certification in both specialties. He had clinical experience from his training and practice in both internal medicine and psychiatry and also worked in emergency room settings for four years. For many years, he conducted a private practice in psychiatry with an academic appointment as instructor in psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School he has treated many adult and adolescent patients across a broad range of psychiatric illnesses using a spectrum of medications and psychotherapy over the course of his career. And now, without further ado, I would like to hand the mic over to Mr. Healy. You can begin your presentation when ready. Okay, great. Thanks, Andrew. All righty. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thanks. Well, good morning, everybody, um, or afternoon, depending on where you might be. Um, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Um, we appreciate you making time in your schedules um, to join us. Um, to provide a basis for much of our discussion today, we wanted to first go through some highlights as they pertain to the field of neuropsychology and provide some higher level background as to the development of the field as an independent discipline. At its core, neuropsychology relies upon um, an interdisciplinary collaboration 
uh, to evaluate, describe, and diagnose the interrelatedness between uh, the brain and cognitive and behavioral manifestations. Um, the two main fields that really draw uh, into neuropsychology in, in regards to its practice are neurology and psychology. Um, however, there are other fields and areas of science that also contribute, but these are the two main uh, areas. Um, the idea about the brain behavior connection dates way back and can be observed in early works of Rene Descartes or, or even Aristotle. However, the more tangible evidence that would lay the groundwork for the discipline began to emerge with the works of um, Paul Broca in the mid-19th century. Paul Broca, who was a French physician, was the um, first one to demonstrate the idea of functional localization and brain anatomy. Um, Broca revealed um, through his experiments uh, that patients with non-fluent aphasia had corresponding brain lesions um, in the anterior left hemisphere of the brain. And this was really the first time that someone related um, uh, language with a specific area in the brain. And then shortly afterwards, Karl Wernicke, who was a German physician um, at the time, continued uh, to build on Broca's line of research and identified other areas of, of brain localization for language deficits as well. Um, his discovery of receptive aphasia, uh, which correlated to lesions found in the left posterior region of the temporal lobe, um, continued to build on this idea of language and uh, its relation to um, specific brain structures. Also during this time, we had um, observed an American physician named Robert Bartholow who conducted experiments. Um, uh, he conducted an experiment on a woman who um, actually had her brain exposed due to a cancerous ulcer. And Bartholow applied electrical current stimulation directly to this woman's brain and observed various physical movements as well as a variety of um, emotional responses as well. Uh, the woman was observed to be crying when he uh, uh, touched certain areas of the dura. Um, I would note that during this time, his experiments uh, were viewed as um, unethical and criticized by the American Medical Association, although um, uh, Bartholow did continue to practice and continue on in his research. From this point onward, there were many more advances that paved the way to further refine the understanding of the cause and effect relationship between the brain and behavior and personality. The understanding of the functional organization of the brain continues to this day, um, and we continue to look to refine our understanding of that. Um, advances in technology have greatly advanced in the development of the field. Um, and two of the most prominent advances, um, I would argue, are in the areas of neuropsychological testing and neuroimaging. Okay. Two of the main types of imaging available um, as it relates to neuropsychology really are structural imaging and functional imaging. And it's really functional imaging that is most often utilized to assist in neuropsychological assessment. Um, this functional imaging allows for a finer scale in regards to metabolic functioning. Oftentimes, um, research will even involve the subject um, to have perform various neuropsychological tests concurrently with imaging scans, such as a functional MRI. Um, you, there's been occasions where they will put the subject or the patient into the MRI um, scanning machine and the patient will be able to see above them, either through a mirror or some other type of device, um, a cognitive or neuropsychological test set before them and they will respond to uh, the stimulus on the screens either verbally or by you know pushing a button with their finger and then different areas of their uh, brain activity will light up on the scan. Um, so it, it's all kinds of uses. All right. Apart from neuroimaging uh, procedures, neuropsychological testing is a way for neuropsychology practitioners to measure brain functioning as it relates to structure and processing. This type of testing um, is often done or should be done in a controlled clinical setting and allows for the diagnosis of deficits. 
it has implications for both treatment um, and research as well. Of note is um, Alexander Loria. He was a Russian neuropsychologist who played a major role in defining neuropsychology um, as it's practiced and recognized today. In, in 1962, Loria published uh, his textbook, um, Higher Cortical Functions in Man, and it was this textbook and, and his research that really set the stage for the modern concept of neuropsychology as an independent discipline. Um, other research which followed uh, continued to emphasize the importance of using standardized psychometric tests to guide the systematic observation of the brain behavior relationship. Today, uh, typical neuropsychological assessments cover a wide variety of cognitive and behavioral functioning. Um, the main categories listed on this slide are assessed through numerous standardized tests. The areas cover intellectual functioning, language, memory, executive functioning, um, perception, motor skills, um, and in many cases, um, they will neuropsychological batteries will also include some component of personality assessment. When considering neuropsychological assessment or testing, there are several challenges that um, we face. And two of the main challenges we face in any neuropsychological assessment are variability and inter-rater reliability. Reliability being the consistency of your results and inter-rater reliability referring to the extent to which um, assessors agree um, on their scores or rate consistently on the assessment. Um, the degree of reliability is often determined through a statistical measure of inter-rater agreement. And two of the more common uh, measures are the Cohen's Kappa and Spearman's Rho. Um, these formulas are, are somewhat complicated and I think these days they usually rely on computers to do them for you. But the idea is that any clinical trial relying on data collected from the administration of a neuropsychological assessment should always include a measure of inter-rater reliability. Okay. Limitations of traditional instruments for cognitive assessment consideration um, need to be taken into account. Consideration should be taken when an individual test or a battery of tests are being chosen for administration, uh, either for an individual patient or a group of research subjects. And when deciding on the assessment device or the complement of devices that you're going to use, um, the considerations listed here um, on this slide uh, should be taken into account. Um, for instance, test construction and design. You know, you want to be sure that the tests you're choosing for your battery or your assessment are reliable and based on sound scientific principles. Um, one example that I think of is the Myers-Briggs type indicator test. Um, this test is based on personality tests and not really based on um, science. Um, it's not that it's not useful, but you should be aware um, that you know, extrapolating information from this uh, when, you're, when you're going to assess. Cultural bias is another area that um, should be taken into consideration. Tests should not assume that all individuals have the same experience or proficiency with the English language. Um, you want to take into account, you know, how the test is slanted towards any particular um, cultural uh, group so to speak. Um, accuracy is another important factor. Tests um, can be inaccurate for any number of reasons, um, but individuals taking the test may give false responses. They may fake or distort answers in an effort to portray themselves in a positive light. Um, there are instances where you know, the, you'll get a response from a subject or a patient because they think that is the response that you're looking for. So it's that interaction between the examiner and the rater that can also affect it. So um, these things need to be taken into consideration. Um, the interpretation, again, this is um, an important idea. The same response in some instances may receive different scores depending on who's scoring the test. This relates back to the idea of inter-rater reliability. Um, this limitation may result in an inaccurate test result and ultimately compromise the validity of your test. Um, and then lastly, you want to take into account any intellectual or physical disabilities that may prevent uh, your patient or subject from fully participating in the task. The task, uh, their limitation or disability may have 
um, nothing to do with what the task is trying or the test is trying to assess, but their limitability may be able to limit their ability to participate in that uh, activity, um, and it could render your results um, worthless. Um, so, with all that being said. Um, these advances in the field of neuropsychology um, have and continue to provide one of the most valuable ways for us to gain insight into the functional organization of the brain and the implications it has for addressing a myriad of neurological and neuropsychological diseases. Um, so I think going forward, Dr. Lege is going to now take us further into the connection between neurological disorders um, and their neuropsychiatric considerations. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Lage. Thank you very much. Good morning, okay. everyone. Good afternoon. The, uh, I'm going to start this presentation by quoting Elmore Leonard, who's a famous crime novelist. Some of you may have heard of him. He said that the secret to successful writing is to leave out the parts that people skip over. I think that applies equally well to presentations. I, I may not succeed, but apologies in advance. So we're going to start by looking at a couple of examples of where neuropsychological tests are important and where certain advancements in the field have uh, made the question of which ones to use and how to apply them much more wide open. The first is in the field of Alzheimer's disease. As some of you probably know, there's been a number of recently failed trials that uh, some companies spent a great deal of money on to try and show that they could have an impact on Alzheimer's disease, and we're unable to. And it turns out that it, it may be that we're treating the disease too late in the course. We can identify <clears throat> Alzheimer's disease, but um, it's hard to identify it early before it's actually manifested. The FDA recently issued a guidance for industry in uh, February of 2013 that uh, presents and discusses these following challenges, namely that the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is based on criteria that are almost 30 years old and requires the presence of dementia so that they're not really applicable to very early stage disease. The same uh, guidance introduces these various concepts of minimal cognitive impairment, which may or may not be due to Alzheimer's disease, a prodromal Alzheimer's disease, and maybe even preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Are there ways to detect these through neuropsychological testing and, of course, as Matt mentioned, through neuroimaging, through various biomarkers? The FDA has designated that it's not enough to show that uh, a, a drug may be effective in reducing, for example, the signs of dementia. It also has to improve function. So there has to be a change in the signs of the illness as well as an improvement of functioning. The challenge in earlier stage diseases is that functional impairment may be minimal and difficult to assess. So studies that show a delay in cognitive impairment may be sufficient. By the way, the FDA has recommended the clinical dementia rating, some of boxes, which is a free-form, semi-structured clinical assessment as the best way to cover both uh, cognition and function. This guidance also presented an important potential accelerated approval mechanism for early Alzheimer's disease. The FDA said that they would consider an effect on a valid and reliable cognitive assessment used as a single primary efficacy measure to support marketing approval, as long as it was followed by post-approval studies to demonstrate that the benefit persists. Another approach would be a survival analysis, which includes a single composite of cognition and function. <clears throat> I'm having some screen freeze here. Here we go. OK. <clears throat> the guidance also discusses the importance of demonstrating disease modification. 
it's not enough to give a drug and show that there's some uh, effect that you can reverse. The current drugs that are approved for Alzheimer's disease clearly do not impact the disease itself. They simply change the balance of neurotransmitters and help the brain deal better with the disease as, as it advances. So the FDA is really interested in uh, drugs or approaches that modify the underlying Alzheimer's disease. This brings us to biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of uh, measurement of serum and spinal fluid, A beta uh, proteins. And the FDA is willing to accept that a single primary surrogate efficacy measure could be considered for accelerated approval. It's just that none has been identified as yet that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. So that's the dilemma in the field. We've even got approval for um, imaging drugs that bind to amyloid, but uh, there's no evidence yet that they have a meaning in terms of predicting what happens with Alzheimer's disease. If they also mentioned a couple of different alternative trial designs that are interesting to look at, which we won't go into right at the moment. So the standard for cognitive testing in Alzheimer's disease has been the so-called ADAS-COG, which stands for Alzheimer's Disease Assessment Scale Cognitive. This has been an industry standard. The FDA has generally required it. There's a single score. Uh, unlike most tests, the best score is zero, and the worst score is 70. And this test covers cognition, as you would expect from the name, and also some elements of praxis, or what is known as use of the hands to manipulate things, like draw figures and things like that. Unfortunately, the NSCOG lacks measures of attention, planning, working memory, and executive function. The other problem with it is that in milder forms of dementia, like pre-dementia, mild cognitive impairment populations, there's not a linear relationship between disease severity and the rate of change in the ADAS-COG. And even for mild and moderate Alzheimer's disease, up to 75% of subjects score a 0 or a 1, which as you recall is minimal impairment, in more than half of the ADAS-COG components. This is a problem called the ceiling effect. So what's the alternative? There's been a lot of development in the neuropsychological area to attempt to identify tests that do a better job at picking up uh, some of the things that the ADAS-COG doesn't pick up. There's the ADAS-COG plus delayed recall. Um, it's marginally better than the standard ADAS-COG 11 for a mild cognitive impairment. Oops, we've skipped ahead, sorry. I'll go back. There we go. Um, some researchers have developed what's called the NTB, the Neuropsychological Test Battery. That's nine validated cognitive tests, which are listed here. And this has a much better linear decline over time uh, in both high 21 to 26 and low, 15 to 20, mini mental status exam scoring ranges. The MMSC is a standard test neurologists use to screen for cognitive impairment. As I just mentioned, the trouble with the 8S COG is that it doesn't really detect people with, who are only minimally demented. I mentioned the clinical dementia rating sum of boxes score that the FDA recommends because it incorporates this functional measure, which is also, by the way, required by the EMA for approval of anti-dementia medicines in Europe. There's an interesting test that I don't think probably gets as much uh, publicity as it should, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. This has excellent sensitivity in identifying mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease compared to the relatively poor performance of the um, in Alzheimer's disease. Very 
very specific, identifying 87% of normal controls. <clears throat> All right. Now, part of the point of this talk is to look at what's available in the neuropsychological area using computers. As Matthew mentioned, inter-rater reliability, consistency among raters is a problem because raters differ one from the other. The computer program, on the other hand, presents the test material consistently in the same way every time. You push a button and the program rolls. You do have to control for the environment, for the lighting, for whether the seat the patient is sitting on is comfortable enough, etc. But at least you don't have to control for another human being once the person is introduced to the test. So the cognitive drug research, or CDR, computerized assessment system, has been around for many, many years. It's currently owned by United Biosource. I should mention, by the way, that none of the commercial companies that I mentioned in this talk uh, I, I am endorsing in any way, nor am I receiving any <laughs> subsidies from them to mention them. They just have been in the business a long time, so people should know about them. So we'll look a little bit later at how Lunesta was approved using some of the CDR tests. But for the moment, there is a dementia a set of tests using these CDR tests, requiring approximately 20 to 25 minutes and available in more than 50 languages, which is very helpful for uh, multinational studies. It's currently being used in several longitudinal studies on aging, as well as in a host of other uh, trials. And it has extensive normative data. The benefits, potential for internet-based testing, ease of use, long history of acceptance with the FDA, and other regulatory agencies. Here are a couple of uh, recent uh, fairly recent publications on the CDR setup for dementia. Computer, a comparison of computerized and pencil and paper tasks for cognitive function and community dwelling older people in the Newcastle 85 plus pilot study. And another comparison of the ADAS COG and the CDR system for assessing change in cognitive function in dementia. There's an Australian company called CogState that also has developed uh, some neuropsychological tests that I think are fairly culturally and linguistically neutral. As Matt mentioned, that's important to reduce uh, bias and uh, transcend any language differences. This again uses a computer interface and minimal human assistance. Also 20 to 25 minutes, available in 71 languages, and sensitive for discriminating mild memory decline from healthy control participants at 94%, and specific for the same group at 100%, which is pretty amazing. This has been used in a longitudinal study of community dwelling adults over age 50. Uh, where it was found that any decline in the COG state visual learning accuracy measure <clears throat> over a 12-month period was highly associated with cerebral amyloid accumulation on amyloid PET imaging. So that's the kind of validation that, that sponsors and uh, neuropsychiatric test companies need in order to have their tests utilized in an effective way. Okay, one last slide on CogState. These are the strengths, again, ease of use, minimal human supervision, data for administration, data entry, or scoring, a relatively strong publication record in aging research, and excellent psychometric properties. For example, if the people take the test over and over again, that does, they don't tend to improve on it. This allows internet-based administration, meaning you can test anybody anywhere as long as they've got a computer and an internet connection. And because of that, it has the current capability for real-time quality assurance and data reporting. So this aspect may make the measure uniquely suited for data collection in large studies, where the endpoints might be 
chosen for active monitoring by DSMBs or remote monitoring of changes even in the home Senate. All right, the next uh, topic we're going to look at is that of insomnia and anxiety uh, treated by sedatives and hypnotics. We're going to take a, a turn down memory lane. Some of you may be old enough to remember what happened with triazolam. It was approved in the early 80s, and before long you started to get articles uh, like this. You don't have to be a neuroscientist to forget everything with triazolam, but it helps. Transient global amnesia secondary to triazolam. Handwriting in amnestic states. Finally, this dramatic case of triazolam overdose, alcohol, and manslaughter. What was the end result? The largest dose strength was withdrawn from the market in the US, and the drug altogether was withdrawn in the United Kingdom in 1991 due to this risk of psychiatric adverse reactions. So a little bit of history, but um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So as recently as last month, the FDA warned of next day impairment with Lunesta and lowered the recommended dose. And suggested on the day before to avoid driving the day after using Ambien, CR20. And there are various other FDA communications about the risk of next morning impairment with insomnia drugs and lower recommended dose for things like Zolpidem. So what happened? Turns out the FDA guidance on evaluating hypnotics has been around since 1977. Single dose trials should encompass the following general principles, residual effects of drug on alertness, mood change, judgment, etc. And how are these to be determined? Well, observation by a trained behavior, but also drug effect on various tests of coordination, balance, and reaction time, and for lack of recall or amnesia. So when the sponsor brought Lunesta to the FDA to get it approved, the original approvable letter back in 2004 requested additional analyses of accidental injury and the adverse events related to memory impairment and psychomotor impairment. <clears throat> so this led to the company to do additional studies which showed that 10% of drug-treated patients versus 6% of placebo patients had accidental injuries in a six-month trial. In elderly patients, falls not related to low blood pressure were experienced by 1.4% of lanesta-treated patients at 2 milligrams and by 0% at 1 milligram versus 0.5% in placebo-treated patients. The cognitive, psychomotor, and memory functions were evaluated in two crossover studies with these doses and showed uh, decrements on drug compared to placebo in these functions at 9.5 and, and 12.5 and hours post-dose with, again, this, this, this was the CDR battery that we'll look at a little more closely now. This was a little more information. Again, the patients were tested with a battery of computerized cognitive tests, but there were only 12 of them. And in general, there were numerous decrements in functioning, although few reached formal statistical significance. You should not be surprised by this with an N of 12. <laughs> Obviously, in retrospect, they were significant. Now, if you look at the Lunesta prescribing information or the approved labeling test, uh, you can't say we weren't warned because people who got three milligrams, even at these young ages, at these distances after the dose, uh, when tested for these things, psychomotor coordination, memory, and sedation and coordination, found that next morning psychomotor and memory impairment was most severe at seven and a half hours, but still present and clinically meaningful at 11 and a half hours. Subjective perception of sedation and coordination was not consistently different from placebo, even though subjects were objectively impaired. Okay. 
So part of the point I'm making is that uh, these computerized tests that were provided by CDR actually did their job. They identified these problems. But the sponsor uh, was able to get this past the FDA, partly because the FDA was suspicious of these computerized tests and felt they hadn't been uh, validated enough. I don't think we're going to have time to go into what these tests are in detail, but the slide deck has descriptions of them, and I've got some hidden slides that I'll pass on that uh, describe these tests. They're not too complicated uh, for reaction time. When yes appears on the screen, you press the yes button on your computer console. The reaction time is how long it takes between the one and the other, which can be easily me uh, measured. The tracking test is how close you can keep the mouse to an X that moves around the computer screen. The average distance between your pointer and the moving X is, is the measure. As it turns out, Lunesta was also evaluated with um, visual analog scale questionnaires for sleepiness, alertness, and ability to function. But we just heard that people felt they were fine, even though they were objectively impaired. And here's the key point. The reviewer objected that the duration of testing sessions, the references, and the descriptions of reliability and validity, and potential practice effects of these tests were not provided. It didn't seem to prevent the FDA from approving the, uh, the drug. Again, I have nothing against Lunesta. <laughs> All right. Here's a couple brief examples. I'm mentioning this one just so that I can show you this slide, which really tickled my funny bone. The main scale used for this assessment is the um, Arizona sexual experience scale called the ASEX, which measures these things. I skipped over the previous slide, but that just gives the FDA uh, requirement that these antidepressants having significant effects on sexual functioning should be assessed for these effects. Suicidal ideation and behavior. Um, you know, run through this one quickly. Most of you are probably familiar with the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale and the FDA guidance that commands that sponsors and trialists use some kind of suicide measurement uh, in antidepressant drugs and actually anti-epileptic drugs and several others. The people at Columbia have, have developed a standard coding system for classifying suicidal behavior and ideation, which is called the C-CASA categories. And these are embodied into the uh, CSSRS. So they include these 11 categories for ideation, behavior, and they run the gamut from passive to active, nonspecific, active with a method but no intent or plan, active with method and intent but no plan, and then active with method intent and plan and behavior. And also self-injurious behavior without suicidal intent, which can be puzzling to some people. So the CSSRS can be administered uh, remotely as an electronic self-report version. Very quick to use if people have no findings, and not that burdensome even in people with findings. There have been 15,000 administrations of the electronic self-report version. It does require a little trainer rating, a little rater training. We'll skip over this. For attention deficit disorder, I just wanted to highlight a recently published article that used um, the cognitive drug research computerized test battery. In this particular measure, the power of attention score, which is, su is a sum of simple reaction time, choice reaction time, and digit, digit vigilance speed, and was able to separate impaired attention at baseline and response to treatment uh, with these computerized measures. 
So again, uh, fairly objective. Um, there's a problem with using computerized tests for people with ADHD because some of them have not so much of a attention deficit but an interest deficit. And if they like to play computer games, they actually do very well on these tests. So <laughs> we've got to watch out for that. So the uh, slide deck contains some links to tests that you can try online. They're fun to do. Uh, the most available ones were with the Cambridge Cognition or the CanTab. There's some links to, to these tests. Uh, for memory, attention, um, executive function, decision making. And um, we're going to, if I can get it to work, take a look at uh, one of their one of their uh, tests. I don't know if you can hear the sound effects. So this is a demonstration. You use the mouse to move the pointing finger and click it to touch the test screen. So the idea is to make the bottom pattern look like the top pattern. So for this case, it's easy to do by just moving one ball. Same for this one. I like to show this test because it's so colorful and it does have some challenges. Now this one's a little tougher. And I think there's one more uh, which requires right. These do have a practice effect because I've gotten better at them preparing for this webinar. <laughs> but if you've never seen this before, it takes a while to figure it out and uh, get up to speed. And it does measure your capacity to think and plan for these things. OK. So what's the conclusion? Neuropsychological measurements are important in clinical trials, not only for efficacy, as we saw in the Alzheimer's uh, example, but also for safety. You don't want the patient taking the drug and driving off the road the next day. Computerized forms of these tests have assisted in regulatory approval for many new molecular entities in the neuropsychiatric area. They definitely, they definitely have their place. However, buyer beware. Before you invest in one of these, you want to make sure that these tests are reliable, that they've been validated with accepted standard tests, that they're sensi sensitive to the disease under study. And that, again, is true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives and specific. They exclude the true negatives, uh, which is this over that. Also, it's a good idea to get regulatory agency buy-in for the use of particular tests before you spend a lot of money testing people with them in your clinical trial. As obviously the CDR tests and the COG state tests have regulatory agency experience, and the, Cam the Cambridge cognition tests do as well. And there's a fair amount of published literature that demonstrates the reliability, validity, et cetera, of some of these computerized tests. But I, I should mention there's a lot of them out on the market. We've only scratched the surface. So I think that's my allotted time, and that leaves us some time for questions. So I'll turn it back to our moderator, Andrew. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. And thank you also to Matthew for that great uh, presentation, lots of insightful information there. At this point, I would like to invite our audience to continue sending their questions and comments in right now for the Q&A portion of the webinar. And I've already received some questions, so I'll start with the ones that we have here. Our first question, uh, what is meant by ceiling and floor effects with the ADAS COG? Very good. Well, ceiling effects are what happens when the test is too easy. Everybody passes it. 
Everybody knows that 2 plus 2 is 4. A floor effect is when the test is so hard that nobody passes it. Uh, for some of us, that would be anything doing to do with higher mathematics. So the ideal test uh, has a, a high ceiling and a low floor, and it catches the entire spectrum of the disease. That's one of the problems with the ADAS cog, actually, at either end. It doesn't do very well in measuring severe dementia either, but it's hard to get people with severe dementia to interact much. So that's a problem that no test can really overcome. Absolutely. OK. Well, thank you for that. Um, our next question, uh, are there learning effects with testing uh, that is repeated several times with the same patient? Uh, your thoughts on that? Is that one for you, Matt? Oh. Yeah, I think it's for Matt. I can go that if you'd like. Um, yeah, so this is a definite concern, um, especially where the deficit is unrelated to memory. Um, and I think to, uh, to control for this, um, many test creators will um, proactively design two or more alternate versions of a test um, to control for that, that phenomenon. Um, however, it, it can still be an issue. I know that, um, for instance, with the mini mental status examination, this is a good example because many um, elderly folks are presented with this brief test, which is really aimed at quickly assessing memory, concentration, orientation, um, et cetera. Many of these folks are presented with this test in various uh, scenarios, either at their primary care physician or, or a specialty physician. They're, they're exposed to this at repeated times. I know that when I was in graduate school um, administering neuropsychological test batteries, it was not uncommon for patients to um, preemptively provide responses on this, assent on this particular assessment before I was even able to ask the question. Um, so it, it's definitely a concern. It happens. They try and control for it uh, with alternate versions um, and, and delays between. Um, but it's something to take into consideration. All right. Thank you for that. Um, our next question here, why was Lunesta approved despite the objective evidence of significant next day impairment? Uh, your thoughts? That's a good question. Uh, I looked at the, uh, all the data in preparing for this talk because it was interesting to me. I, I think uh, uh, these problems exist with all of the sedative hypnotics. There's no escaping them. It's just a matter of where you set the dose level for maximizing uh, efficacy versus safety. And sometimes that's hard to do as, based on phase three trials, which don't use that many patients and don't give you that much of a chance to see some of these rarer adverse events. You'd expect a little bit of impairment in almost anyone, but um, the and, I'm, and it's obvious that uh, although triazolam was taken off the market in the UK, it's still available in the US, and the Lunesta hasn't been withdrawn either. The maximum available doses have just been reduced. So there's a certain, uh, the FDA, if, it, if drugs meet a certain safety level, they can't, uh, they, they can't really hold them back. It's, it's, uh, it's part of the American system. <laughs> OK, well, thank you for that. Um, another question here, are there other instruments for measuring uh, suicidal ideation and behavior besides the CSSRS? Yes, there are other instruments. But the FDA requires all of them to, to categorize the information gathered into those 11 categories, five suicidal ideation, five suicidal behavior, and the one self-injurious behavior that's not suicidal. So they've all got to be set up that way, at least in the United States, because the FDA requires it. There, there is a caveat. The FDA gives you an out if people are uh, either too young, like very young children, or have intellectual impairments, like uh, people with autism, or um, significant degrees of dementia. You still have to inquire or check into suicidal ideation or behavior, but you don't have to use one of these more formal instruments if the patient is too intellectually limited or too young to really uh, comply with it. OK, thank you for that. Um, another question, 
A little more general this time, how are uh, neuropsychological tests scored? Um, I, can, I can respond to that. Uh, I, I think it depends upon the individual test. Um, there's different ways to score these different tests. There's different ways to interpret them, um, you know, between raw scores or T-scores or, or whatever. But in general, um, when you're looking at a person's score on a test, um, the idea is that it's compared to a larger general population's normative sample, if you will. Um, you know, and that normative sample really should be drawn from a comparable population to the patient or subject that you are um, that you're examining. Normative studies um, will often provide data that is stratified, you know, based on somebody's age or uh, ethnicity um, or education level, even. Um, and uh, so it, it has better correlation uh, to, uh, to a particular test. It allows for the person's performance to be compared to you know, a suitable group of, of individuals and therefore provide um, a more fair assessment of the, of the current performance on the test. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, our next question. Uh, you mentioned a controlled environment for the administration of tests. Uh, what would that involve exactly? Uh, um, so testing usually involves um, a systematic administration of clearly defined procedures in, in a pretty formal environment. Folks who administer um, neuropsychological test battery, and this is, uh, Tom may be able to talk more about the computer aspects of this, but if you're doing uh, the paper and pencil, you know, one-to-one -one, uh, examination on a test, these folks are usually trained. They're usually um, on the master's or PhD level, and they're trained extensively in, in the administration of it so that they are minimizing any types of environmental distractions uh, or biases that may creep into it. Um, you know, the examiners are really trained to convey a neutral and consistent attitude so that they are not uh, eliciting any kind of uh, particular responses of a subject based on a relationship between the examiner and the examinee. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. We have reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. If you do have any further questions, however, you can direct them to the email address showing on your screen. That's info at premier-research.com. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. And a survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated, as it will help us improve our further webinars. Now, please join us in thanking our speakers for today, Dr. Thomas Lage and Matthew Healy. We hope that you found this conference informative today. Have a great day, everyone. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Andrew.